Blue Smooth Lovers, we are here in Kudenborg, eind augustus. And uh, for the first time over on the mainland in Europe, now on the mainland in Holland, let's say uh, that way. Albert Cummings, welcome, guy. Oh, thank you, business. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's now about 30 minutes that you've been on stage. How was it for you? It was great. It, uh, I've never seen people stand in the pouring rain like that before. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was amazing to see. Does it, you know, it, <laughs> you could tell, I couldn't tell when it was raining, but. As soon as the umbrellas would all pop up, it was pouring. It was, was, I was, on, I was on, on, on the VIP stage, and I would see everybody. Was, so when you're, I was soaking wet, but he stayed in front right? of you. Yeah, that's uh, that's one thing. You always try to read the audience. I at least, I at least try to play it for the audience. So if I know they're standing there in the pouring rain, chances are they're probably okay with what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it absolutely is. But uh, let's for our listeners, Albert Cummings. Um, we know he is a household name in, the, in America, but um, let's go to the beginning. Um, first of all, you picked up a music instrument. Why? Um, I don't know. I, I, uh, I've always been a, had a love for music, I guess. I just uh, I played trumpet when I was a little kid and uh, learn how to read music with a trumpet and all that stuff and just always had an interest. And when I was about 12, I, I couldn't fit my hand around a guitar, so I picked up a uh, five-string banjo, which, <laughs> which is a small neck, and I'd play uh, a lot of bluegrass music, which I don't know how that goes over over here, but in the States, it's very popular now. But it wasn't at my time. It was a, it was a very underground music that you had to find. So. I played that for a few years, and then when I was about 15, I finally could fit my hand around a guitar and and literally only learned a few chords and would just mess around with it. Um, and I never started to really learn anything about the guitar until I was 27 years old. So it was a long time for me to actually. It was I was 27 years old before I ever played with a band. You never picked up the guitar for the for the chicks. I didn't even know there was. I mean, uh, they they say the chicks like the guitar players. I don't know. I think they like the drummers actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I never realized anything about that. I just I did it because I wanted to do it, and, and um, it's been a it's been the most rewarding choice I've ever made in my life. I guess it is rewarding because I was yeah. pretty young when um, you cooperated with a certain band. Well, it's yeah. a huge name in the blues business. This was Double Trouble. Yeah, Double Trouble. Um, that would be uh, uh, an accolade after, after It certainly name. is, and, it, and I still can't believe to this day that that happened to me. I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that. I, uh, I say that a lot, but it's still one of those pinch me moments where um, I literally had a, about 100 gigs under my belt at that time. I just started, and uh, Stevie Ray was my ultimate idol. And Double Trouble was my ultimate idol. I didn't know anything about anybody in the blues except Double Trouble. I didn't. I didn't really even understand where Stevie came from at that time. I was just learning that stuff, and I, uh, I was. I got my start in Albany, New York, which is about an hour from my house, and uh, used to go over there and play gigs, and and uh, come back in the in the morning, get on the job with the construction, and. Yep. And uh, I got a good following in, in uh, a college over there, very prominent college called RPI, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, wanted to have a blues day in the RPI Fieldhouse. And to even make the story even stranger, uh, uh, the last place I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble, I got to see him twice. The last place I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble was in the RPI Fieldhouse. And They wanted to do this show, and they called me, and they said, we want you to be the local headliner, and who do you think we should get for the national headliner? And I, I of course, I jokingly said, why don't you have Double Trouble come play with me? And I thought it was a joke. <laughs> and they said, that's a really good idea. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was walking into the, the RPI Fieldhouse for the first time since I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble. I was now fronting Double Trouble in the RPI Fieldhouse. For our listeners, uh, for our viewers, what year was that? Oh, that's, I'm, I'm going to say that was like 1999, maybe 2000. That was... Just awesome. That's yeah. a, a beautiful example for giving, of uh, shouting out your um, your dreams out loud. Yes, it, it certainly is. It, it really is. And, you know, I, I, I have a saying that I like that's, uh, you get 100% of what you don't ask for. <laughs> You, if you if you don't ask for something, you get 100% of that. You won't get that. 
But if you ask for it, it and you want fun. that, somehow the universe, it'll come to you yeah. if you want it to come to you. And I should do it a lot more sometimes, but but that came to me. It was just one of those things. And I found in music that the most beautiful things that ever happen just happen naturally. I can't force them to happen. They just come to you and they just happen. And, and if they're not supposed to happen, they don't happen. That's even what, if you want them to happen. It wasn't meant to be, you know. Yeah, if, even if you, like I've had things that I've just wanted and wanted and wanted and wanted and and it and it doesn't happen and and you're frustrated, but then you realize, you know, years later that, God, if that had happened, it would have killed this or it would have done, the, you know, yeah. it's strange how things work. So I, I, I kind of live by that stuff, so. Um, Nevertheless, in the daytime, you're a constructor, you're, 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 and quite a successful carpenter who built complete houses, not only. Yeah, we, we do uh, a lot of construction. I'm the only, uh, I'm the only musician on a, on a touring scale that I know that has a day job. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, uh, there's a lot of things happen with music, so I don't know how long that day job's going to be there anymore. I really, all I want to do in my life is play music. Seriously, straight out, nothing more. I give it all up to go for it, and uh, I think that time's coming close. I know it was it it, it, it worked for you uh, for quite a few times, and but you have to work for it. You have to be the creative um, to make songs. And if I make a run through to all the albums you made, there's all a small hinge of country in it. There's a, the, yes. the 500 miles world, that's a, that, that's a song you play at the Indianapolis, uh, Indianapolis 500 circuit, you know, that's, that's, and my buddy and me, we weren't a lot of in, uh, in America, and we know there's so much good country music in it, and we yeah. know we are a blue station, but there's still a crossover that's still uh -huh. made, and uh -huh. I think you can do it. Well, they say the difference between blues and country is whiskey versus beer. <laughs> <laughs> the percentage of alcohol what you drink. So <laughs> it's the same chord patterns. It's just arranged differently, you know. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's a genre. I, I, I like Europe. If, what I see about Europe is it's not so genre related. Right. Like in the United States, it's, uh, they have to put you in one of the five genres. So you, you are automatically pegged. You know, you're, oh, he's a blues guy. He played some. He played some Stevie Ray Vaughan stuff. He's a blues guy. That's it. But I certainly came from the country route, so you. I, I'm glad that you hear some of that, because I came from the the Hank Williams Jr. to the Merle Haggard to the, um, yeah. you know, what, what's on your... and on Vince Gill, all these people. You know, it's just like that. That stuff relates to me too. Now, the new country. Uh, I, I don't, it's kind of gone pop, you know, yeah. so that doesn't relate to me as well as the old George Jones things and, you know, the, and all of that original things. But I guess that's probably just, just an old man talking right now, you know, versus, you know, it's, uh, I like the, I like the, I like anything with heart and soul. I don't like production and produce things that are just going on and on. That's, that's something we noticed when you played live and we said, Instead of him, he's playing as of his, his last thing he's ever going to play today. He's, because he's going to, he's going to, he's in Holland and he's going to make an impression to last. So I hope I did that tonight. I, yeah. I do, I do consciously think that way. I do think that way, and I, I think I, I everybody blew, who I comes both. here for one gig thinks that way. Yeah, and uh, and you know, I, I do, I do play like it's the last thing. I. I I, there's nothing I love more so it's like I've got to give it my all and if you don't you know Buddy Guy I sat with Buddy Guy backstage one night and he told me you got to give 110% that's what you got to do you got to give 110% every night and that sounds easy but and, and one off show is pretty easy but performers that are out yeah. for weeks or months at a time and you're in your you just get so tired. It's it's you know I work a full time job in construction, and it's tiring and it's exhausting. Yeah, but physical, it's not. Physical labor. It's not as hard as touring. It really. The playing is not the hard part. Nope, you don't get. But you don't get played for the playing. The playing is why you do it. The playing is what you enjoy doing. You get paid to lug the equipment, drive the vehicles, you know. Go to the check-in of the hotels. Do all the stuff. That, do everything that goes on 
behind the scenes. And the first thing Double Trouble told me, it was Chris Layton, the drummer, and he said, being a rock star is great for one hour a day. <laughs> and the rest of it is nothing but work. And most people think, oh, oh, I wish I had that lifestyle. Watch what you wish for, because it's, it's hard. Yeah. But I wouldn't change it for the world. You know, I sure work in construction is like, I talk, to, I talk to musicians all the time that think they work hard. Yeah. They don't know what work is, you know. Um, but, but, but touring is hard work, but construction is a whole different type of hard work. <laughs> yeah, we did an interview with um, Josh Sardegut. He told him, my daddy said he has to go up at 8 o'clock and he was 5 or 6 o'clock and he had to work hard. What I do is easy, he said, compared to what he does. But you have to do for it, and you have to go for it, and you work hard, and then yeah. maybe you're successful. Yeah, That's, yeah, you uh, you have to give it your all. If you if you write a song, um, how do you write? Is it an uh, is it a musical idea or is it an, uh, a lyric where you where it came up? For? It's an idea that I start with. I always start with an idea, and obviously I don't have any hit songs, so I don't know if you want to take my advice on songwriting. No. But for me, um, it's an idea. It just comes from. Uh, it could be a conversation you and I have. You might say some saying. You might say a phrase about something that might make me think about something else. And I'll say, that's the idea. And I used to I used to play, you know, I, I, if I'm practicing or I'm playing at home and I come up with some kind of an idea. Um, I used to, like, think I would remember it. But... I've, I've forgotten more things than I've come up with. You get more, more than instruments for it. But now with a like, I, like I'm not a, a tech head, right? But I learned how to use my phone for simple voice recording. Mm. So if I come up with some idea on a guitar, I will record that on my phone. Just simply, you know, have it on my phone. And then when that idea comes, I have this. Yeah. I have this like literally a menu of ideas, and I say. This would fit that idea because it all has to fit. The the idea of the the song and the vocals have to fit the music, right? It has to. You can't you can't. Uh, it's a be, story you're telling. Yeah, you can't be so depressed and upset or angry and try to write a song and put a happy lick to it. You just can't. And that's that's where it goes. You have to like. It has to be molded. It has to be fit together. And um, I, like I said, I haven't had a hit song, but no, that's but that's my take on what it. What is a hit? Yeah, I, the blues world is a small world, but uh, it is a small world. But I have a lot of people that relate to my songs, and that's that's again rewarding. That I'm like I'm bringing something to someone that that nobody else has brought to them and I get to bring it to them and it's just how I feel and it's kind of cool even if it's a small percentage of people it's still very nice for me to be able to think wow I've, I've had so many people I've had people tell me stories about my music I didn't want to hear how important uh, I, the band for you you brought them with you the the band my band right now I think that Scott Sutherland I think he's the best bass player that I've ever met Worldwide, I'm gonna I'm gonna say worldwide. Bar you know you're gonna, you're on a lead now. You know you're on a big stretch where you're gonna say the best bass player in the world. Yeah, well, <laughs> for, for what I do and what I've done, I mean, is there someone better? Perhaps. I have not met that person, and I've met a lot of bass players, and I feel the same way about Warren on the drums. I really do. I love those guys off the stage, and I love them on the stage. And and to me. I've had bass players and I've had drummers on my stage that I literally can't stand, you know. And <laughs> a good you, how do you, great players, but how do you have a chemistry that no. flows when you're really angry at the person or you're like, oh, he's doing that again. Oh, you know, it, you just, if you're <laughs> thinking, you're stinking and your mind starts to flow. But the chemistry of the three of us together, I just enjoy it. I think it's a really, the, the best form that I've had of the band yet. So. I will get this. It's now, let's see, 24th, 25th of August, mm -hmm. 2018. Mm -hmm. um, it's the pivotal, pivotal point in your career that you now say that Europe is ready for me. I don't know. I don't know if they are. We'll see. Are you I ready go. for Europe? I'm, I'm ready. I, uh, I'm, I've been wanting to come to Europe since I started. 
because the it seems that Europeans understand music a lot differently and better, in my opinion, than the United States because the U.S. is fed. It's the, you know the popular radio. It's fed. This is what's popular, and now it's become sounds. It's become synthesized sounds, and the record industry seems to be set up on what thirteen-year-old girls like, literally. And I don't, I don't. That's that's okay. That's what it is. That's business. I don't, I don't particularly like. I like people that enjoy music, and I, I find the Europeans seem to enjoy music. I mean, what, I don't what's know. playing over there? Have a new play. Uh a couple of gigs in the weekend is sitting on tables or people chatting and just going for a good time or just are they coming for Abel Cummings? Well, that's a, a tough question to me to answer because I think they're coming to see us because nobody tends to talk much. They, they tend to watch oh, sure. and uh, they tend to be a part of the show. I mean, the audience is a part of the show whether they realize it no matter where you are, whether you're in Holland, well, the United States, the audience is a part of the show in the fact that how they perceive and how they receive the artists, that tells the artist, um, should I back off or should I give you more? Right. Okay. And if they're into it and they enjoy it, and there's a chemistry with the audience, they encourage the artist, whether it's me or anybody else, they encourage them to give them more. And the audience in return sends the energy back that's... This is this energy that's unspoken that I don't I can't explain, but it just builds and builds and builds, and that's what makes a great gig. I mean, I've had I've had great gigs. I've had bad gigs. Yeah. I, you know, I I've had I've had the worst gigs in the world, and people have told me that's the best gig they've ever seen. I, from I, my I own noticed, thoughts. I noticed yeah. that musicians say that often. You know, I uh -huh. was bad, and people still love it. Whatever, what I'm doing on stage, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm just honored every time I pick up a guitar. Period. We were honored that you were in. A, well, I'm. I can't tell. Front of our cameras and blues moves ready. I, I know. I, can't, I, know I can't tell you how much I appreciate even this. I, I I love the people of this this whole world. I just want to go out and play all I can. We can and, help. We're gonna. And, you're and gonna any, be a part and, of it. And anybody that helps me, I guarantee you, I will remember and I will I will return the favor somehow. I, oh, I just just be on stage. is just no, good enough for yeah, us. Well, I'm so grateful to be here. Albert, that's great, man.